How the Louisiana Purchase Changed the World At the point when Thomas Jefferson bought the Louisiana Territory from France, he modified the state of a country and the course of history. Naturally, Pierre Clement de Lausset was disheartened by this startling new development. Having shown up in New Orleans from Paris with his significant other and three little girls only nine months sooner, in March 1803, the developed, common French functionary had expected to rule for six or eight years as pilgrim administrator over the immense region of Louisiana, which was to be France's North American realm. The possibility had been even more satisfying in light of the fact that the region's capital, New Orleans, he had noted with endorsement, was a city with a lot of public activity, style and good breeding. He likewise had preferred the way that the city had a wide range of bosses, moving, music, workmanship, and fencing, and that despite the fact that there were no bookshops or libraries, books could be requested from France. Yet, nearly before Lausset had figured out how to value a decent gumbo and the casual Creole speed of life, Napoleon Bonaparte had unexpectedly chosen to an offer the area to the United States. This left Lausset with little to do however administer when, on a radiant December 20, 1803, the French tricolor was gradually brought down in New Orleans' primary square, the Placette Arms and the American banner was raised. After William C. C. Claiborne and General James Wilkinson, the new chiefs of the region, formally claimed it for the sake of the United States, guaranteeing all occupants that their property, rights and religion would be regarded, celebratory salvos blast from the strongholds around the city. Americans cried, huzzah, and waved their caps, while French and Spanish occupants scowled in morose quietness. Lausset, remaining on the gallery of the city center, burst into tears. The Louisiana Purchase, made 200 years prior this month, almost multiplied the size of the United States. By any action, it was quite possibly the most gigantic land exchanges ever, including a zone bigger than the present France, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Germany, Holland, Switzerland and the British Isles consolidated. All or parts of 15 western states would in the long run be cut from its almost 830,000 square miles, which extended from the Gulf of Mexico to Canada, and from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains. What's more, the cost, $15 million, or around four pennies a section of land, was a stunning deal. Allow the land to cheer, General Horatio Gates, a noticeable New York State lawmaker, revealed to President Thomas Jefferson when subtleties of the arrangement arrived at Washington, D.C., for you have gotten Louisiana for an extremely good price. Wealthy in gold, silver and different minerals, just as enormous forests and unlimited grounds for touching and cultivating, the new procurement would make America massively affluent. Or then again, as Jefferson put it in his standard downplayed way, the richness of the country, its environment and degree, guarantee in due season important aids to our depository, an abundant arrangement for our posterity, and a widespread field for the endowments of opportunity. American students of history today are more candid in their energy for the procurement. With the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, this is one of the three things that made the advanced United States, says Douglas Brinkley, head of the Eisenhower Center for American Studies in New Orleans and co-author with the late Stephen E. Ambrose of the Mississippi and the Making of a Nation. Charles A. Chirami, creator of Jefferson's Great Gamble, concurs. On the off chance that we had not made this buy, it would have squeezed off the chance of our turning into a mainland power, he says. That, thusly, would have implied our thoughts on opportunity and popular government would have conveyed less weight with the remainder of the world. This was the way into our global impact. The bicentennial is being commended with year-long exercises in a large number of the states molded from the region. Be that as it may, the point of convergence of the festivals is Louisiana itself. The most yearning occasion opens this month at the New Orleans Museum of Art. Jefferson's America and Napoleon's France, April 12 to August 31st, a remarkable presentation of compositions, models, beautiful expressions, memorabilia and uncommon reports, presents an amazing glance at expressions of the human experience and driving figures of the two nations at this urgent time ever. What we needed to do was advance individuals' comprehension of the significance of this second, says Gail Feigenbaum, lead guardian of the show. It's about something other than a whopper of a land bargain. What sort of world were Jefferson and Napoleon living and working in? We likewise show that our political and social relationship with France was uncommonly rich at that point, a lively trade that adjusted the state of the cutting-edge world.
The Louisiana region was brought into the world on April 9, 1682, when the French voyager Robert Cavalier, Seer, Lord, de La Salle, raised a cross in section close to the mouth of the Mississippi and seriously read a revelation to a gathering of confounded Indians. He claimed the entire Mississippi River Bowl, he admitted, for the sake of the most high, powerful, strong and triumphant prince, Louis the Great, by grace of God ruler of France and Navarre, 14th of that name. And it was to pay tribute to Louis XIV that he named the land Louisiana. In 1718, French adventurer Jean-Baptiste Le Moyne, Sieur de Bienville, established a settlement close to the site of La Salle's declaration, and named it La Nouvelle Orléans for Philippe, Duke of Orléans and Regent of France. When of the Louisiana Purchase, its populace of whites, captives of African source and free people of shading, was around 8,000. A pleasant collection of French and Spanish pilgrim design and Creole bungalows, New Orleans flaunted a flourishing economy dependent on farming fairs. For over a century after La Salle claimed it, the Louisiana Territory, with its dissipated French, Spanish, Acadian and German settlements, alongside those of Native Americans and American-conceived frontiersmen, was exchanged among European eminence at their impulse. The French were intrigued by America, which they frequently represented in artworks and drawings as a befeathered noble savage remaining close to a crock. Yet they couldn't choose whether it was another Eden or, as the naturalist Georges Louis Leclerc de Buffon proclaimed, a crude spot fit uniquely for degenerate living things. However, the authority C was summarized by Antoine de la Moth Cadillac, whom Louis XIV named legislative head of the domain in 1710. Individuals are a heap of the residue of Canada, he sniffed in a 42-page report to the ruler composed not long after he showed up. The officers there were undeveloped and unrestrained, he deplored, and the entire state was not worth a straw right now. Concluding that the zone was useless, Louis XV gave the region to his Bourbon cousin Charles III of Spain in 1763. Yet, in 1800, the district again changed hands, when Napoleon arranged the undercover Treaty of San Ildefonso with Spain's Charles IV. The settlement required the arrival of the huge domain to France in return for the little realm of Etruria in northern Italy, which Charles needed for his girl Louisetta. At the point when Jefferson heard gossipy tidbits about Napoleon's mysterious arrangement, he promptly saw the danger to America's western settlements and its fundamental outlet to the Gulf of Mexico. In the event that the arrangement was permitted to stand, he proclaimed, it would be unimaginable that France and the United States can proceed with long as companions. Relations had been loose with Spain while it held New Orleans, however Jefferson speculated that Napoleon needed to close the Mississippi to American use. This more likely than not been a tweaking second for Jefferson, who had for quite some time been a Francophile. Twelve years prior, he had gotten back from a five-year spell as American pastor to Paris, transporting home 86 instances of decorations and books he had gotten there. The crunch came for Jefferson in October 1802. Spain's King Charles IV at last found time to sign the Imperial Declaration authoritatively moving the domain to France, and on October 16, the Spanish head in New Orleans, Juan Ventura Morales, who had consented to oversee the settlement until his French substitution, Lausit, could show up, subjectively finished the American option to store load in the city obligation free. He contended that the three-year term of the 1795 settlement that had allowed America this privilege and free entry through Spanish region on the Mississippi had lapsed. Spirit's decree implied that American product could presently don't be put away in New Orleans stockrooms. Therefore, catcher's pelts, agrarian produce and completed merchandise gambled openness and burglary on open wharfs while anticipating shipment toward the East Coast and past. The whole economy of America's western regions was in risk. The challenges and dangers are boundless, cautioned the U.S. bad habit delegate in New Orleans, Williams E. Hewlings, in a dispatch to Secretary of State James Madison. As Jefferson had written in April 1802 to the U.S. serve in Paris, Robert R. Livingston, it was essential that the port of New Orleans stay open and free for American trade, especially the products descending the Mississippi River. There is on the globe one single spot, Jefferson expressed, the owner of which is our regular and ongoing adversary. It is New Orleans, through which the produce of three-eighths of our region should pass to showcase. Jefferson's anxiety was more than business. He had a dream of America as a realm of freedom, says Douglas Brinkley. What's more, he saw the Mississippi River not as the western edge of the country, 
but rather as the incredible spine that would hold the mainland together. As it was, frontiersmen, irritated by the revocation of the privilege of store of their products, taken steps to hold onto New Orleans forcibly. The thought was taken up by officials like Senator James Ross of Pennsylvania, who drafted a goal approaching Jefferson to shape a 50,000-man armed force to take the city. The press joined the fight. The United States had the right, roared the New York Evening Post, to direct the future fate of North America, while the Charleston Courier supported claiming the port forcibly of arms. As Secretary of State James Madison clarified, the Mississippi is to them everything. It is the Hudson, the Delaware, the Potomac, and every one of the safe waterways of the Atlantic states, shaped into one stream. With Congress and a vociferous press calling for activity, Jefferson confronted the country's most genuine emergency since the American Revolution. Harmony is our obsession, he announced, and communicated the worry that rash individuals from the resistance Federalist Party may compel us into war. He had effectively educated Livingston in mid-1802 to move toward Napoleon's unfamiliar pastor, Charles Maurice de Talleyrand, to attempt to forestall the cession of the region to France, if this had not previously happened, or, if the arrangement was done, to attempt to buy New Orleans. In his underlying gathering with Napoleon in the wake of taking up his Paris post in 1801, Livingston had been cautioned about old world ways. You have gone to an extremely bad world, Napoleon advised him to be perfectly honest, adding cleverly that Talleyrand was the correct man to clarify what he implied by debasement. A wily political survivor who held high workplaces under the French Revolution, and later under Napoleon's realm and the re-established Bourbon government, Talleyrand had gone through the years 1792 to 1794 in a state of banishment in America in the wake of being upbraided by the Progressive National Convention, and had considered a destructive disdain for Americans. Refinement, he announced, doesn't exist in the United States. As Napoleon's unfamiliar clergyman, Talleyrand generally requested unbelievable payoffs for political outcomes. Notwithstanding a clubfoot and what peers called his dead eyes, he could be beguiling and clever when he needed, which aided disguise his fundamental arranging strategy of postponement. The absence of directions and the need of counseling one's administration are consistently authentic reasons to acquire delays in political issues, he once composed. At the point when Livingston attempted to examine the region, Talleyrand essentially rejected that there was any arrangement among France and Spain. There never was an administration where less should be possible by arrangement than here, a disappointed Livingston kept in touch with Madison on September 1, 1802. There is no individuals, no assembly, no guides. One man is everything. However, Livingston, albeit an unpracticed negotiator, attempted to keep himself educated about the country to which he was minister. In March 1802, he cautioned Madison that France planned to have a main interest in the legislative issues of our Western country and was getting ready to send 5,000 to 7,000 soldiers from its Caribbean province of Saint-Domingue, presently Haiti, to possess New Orleans. Yet, Napoleon's soldiers in Saint-Domingue were being obliterated by an upset and an episode of yellow fever. In June, Napoleon requested General Claude Victor to set out for New Orleans from the French-controlled Netherlands. However, when Victor gathered sufficient men and boats in January 1803, ice impeded the Dutch port, making it unthinkable for him to head out. That very month Jefferson asked James Monroe, a previous individual from Congress and previous legislative head of Virginia, to join Livingston in Paris as pastor unprecedented with optional forces to burn through $9,375,000 to get New Orleans and parts of the Floridas, to combine the U.S. position in the southeastern piece of the landmass. In monetary waterways at that point, Monroe offered his china and furniture to raise travel reserves, requested that a neighbor deal with his properties, and cruised for France on March 8, 1803, with Jefferson splitting caution ringing in his ears. The future predeterminations of this republic relied upon his prosperity. When Monroe showed up in Paris on April 12, the circumstance had, obscure to him, fundamentally modified. Napoleon had unexpectedly chosen to offer the whole Louisiana territory to the United States. He had consistently seen Saint-Domingue, with a populace of more than 500,000, delivering sufficient sugar, espresso, indigo, cotton and cocoa to fill about 700 boats every year, as France's most significant holding in the Western Hemisphere. The Louisiana Territory, in Napoleon's view, was valuable predominantly as a storage facility for Saint-Domingue. 
With the state at risk for being a lost, the area was less valuable. At that point, as well, Napoleon was preparing for another mission against Britain and required assets for that. Napoleon's siblings Joseph and Lucien had gone to see him at the Tuileries Palace on April 7, resolved to persuade him not to sell the domain. For a certain something, they thought of it as stupid to deliberately surrender a significant French hanging on the American landmass. For another, Britain had informally offered Joseph a payoff of £100,000 to convince Napoleon not to allow the Americans to have Louisiana. However, Napoleon's psyche was at that point made up. The first consul turned out to be sitting in his shower when his siblings showed up. Noble men, he reported, think what you please about it. I have chosen to offer Louisiana to the Americans. To come to his meaningful conclusion to his flabbergasted siblings, Napoleon suddenly stood up, at that point dropped once again into the tub, dousing Joseph. A steward drooped to the floor in a week. French antiquarians bring up that Napoleon had a few explanations behind this choice. He presumably inferred that, following American freedom, France couldn't expect to keep a settlement on the American mainland, says Jean Toulard, one of France's first Napoleon researchers. French strategy creators had felt for quite a while that France's assets in the Antilles would unavoidably be polluted by actually opportunity for America and would in the end take their own freedom. By the deal, Napoleon expected to make an immense country in the Western Hemisphere to fill in as a stabilizer to Britain and possibly raise hell for it. On April 11, when Livingston approached Talleyrand for what he thought was one more pointless endeavor to bargain, the unfamiliar clergyman, after the de rigueur casual conversation, unexpectedly found out if the United States would perchance wish to purchase the entire of the Louisiana Territory. Indeed, Talleyrand was barging in on an arrangement that Napoleon had relegated to the French money serve, Francois de Barbe Marbois. The last knew America well, having gone through certain years in Philadelphia in the last part of the 1700s as French envoy to the United States, where he became more acquainted with Washington, Jefferson, Livingston and Monroe. Barbe Marbois got his orders on April 11, 1803, when Napoleon gathered him. I repudiate Louisiana, Napoleon advised him. It isn't just New Orleans that I will surrender, it is the entire state without reservation. I deny it with the best lament. Dot, dot, dot. I require a lot of cash for this conflict, with Britain. Thierry Lentz, a Napoleon history specialist and head of the Fondation Napoleon in Paris, fights that, for Napoleon, it was fundamentally a major land bargain. He was in a rush to get some cash for the exhausted French depository, albeit the generally unobtrusive value shows that he was had in that bargain. However, he figured out how to sell something that he didn't actually have any command over. There were not many French pilgrims and no French organization over the domain, besides on paper. As for Jefferson, notes antiquarian Chirami, he really wasn't out to make this enormous a buy. The entire thing came as a complete amazement to him and his arranging group in Paris, since it was, all things considered, Napoleon's thought, not his. Showing up startlingly at the evening gathering Livingston gave on April 12 for Monroe's appearance, Barbe Marbois circumspectly requested that Livingston meet him soon thereafter at the depository office. There he affirmed Napoleon's longing to sell the domain for $22,500,000. Livingston answered that he would be prepared to buy gave the aggregate was diminished as far as possible. Then he hurried home and worked until 3 a.m. composing an update to Secretary of State Madison, finishing up. We will do everything we can to corrupt the buy. Yet my current assessment is that we will purchase. On April 15, Monroe and Livingston proposed $8 million. At this, Barbe Marbois imagined Napoleon had lost interest. In any case, by April 27, he was saying that $15 million was pretty much as low as Napoleon would go. In spite of the fact that the Americans at that point countered with $12.7 million, the arrangement was struck for $15 million on April 29. The settlement was endorsed by Barbe Marbois, Livingston and Monroe on May 2 and predated to April 30. Albeit the buy was unquestionably a deal, the cost was even more than the youthful U.S. depository could bear. Yet, the creative Barbe Marbois had a response for that as well. He had contacts at Britain's Bering & Co. Bank, which concurred, alongside a few different banks, to make the genuine buy and pay Napoleon cash. The bank at that point turned over responsibility for Louisiana territory to the United States as a trade-off for bonds, 
which were reimbursed more than 15 years at 6% premium, making the last price tag around $27 million. Neither Livingston nor Monroe had been approved to purchase the entirety of the region, or to burn through $15 million. Transoceanic mail required weeks, at times months, every way, so they had no an ideal opportunity to ask for and get endorsement of the arrangement from Washington. Yet, a thrilled Livingston knew that almost multiplying the size of America would make it a significant player on the world scene one day, and he allowed himself some verbal elation. We have lived long, yet this is the noblest work of our entire lives, he said. From this day the United States have their spot among the forces of the main position. It wasn't until July 3rd that information on the buy arrived at U.S. shores, without a moment to spare for Americans to praise it on Independence Day. A Washington paper, the National Intelligencer, reflecting how most residents felt, alluded to the widespread delight of millions at an occasion which history will record among the most amazing in our chronicles. Though we have no authentic proof of how Jefferson felt about the buy, notes Jeremy, reports from those in his circle like Monroe allude to the president's incredible joy, notwithstanding his dread that the arrangement had gone past his sacred forces. Not all Americans concurred, notwithstanding. The Boston Columbian Sentinel editorialized, we are to give cash of which we have excessively little for place where there is which we as of now have excessively. And Congressman Joseph Quincy of Massachusetts so went against the arrangement that he supported severance by the northeastern states, agreeably on the off chance that they can, viciously on the off chance that they should. The ideal greater part, nonetheless, handily won and New England stayed in the Union. With respect to the consistently brief Thomas Jefferson, he squandered little energy on manner of speaking. The illuminated administration of France saw, with just insight, he told Congress, with run-of-the-mill thoughtfulness, on October 17, 1803, the significance to the two countries of such liberal courses of action as might best and forever advance the harmony, kinship, and interests of both. But, energized by the business openings in the West, Jefferson, even before true notification of the deal contacted him, had effectively dispatched Meriwether Lewis to lead a campaign to investigate the domain and the terrain's past. Right to the Pacific. Thank you for watching. Bye now. If you enjoyed this video be sure to give it a like and subscribe to Life is Often if you haven't already click the bell icon to stay updated on all our latest content.